All right, great. Um, let me just um, make sure that I can see all the panels. I had a, um, a chat panel that I had on the side, but when I started presenting, there it goes, uh, it disappeared. Okay, so um, first, I just wanna, again, thank everybody for coming to the meeting. Um, I'm going to present um, uh, FNOOB's Guide to the Security Galaxy. I'm FNOOB. Um, and today is the 21st of July in the year of 2022. So um, this is the overview. Um, can you guys see my screen? Yeah, we can see your screen. Perfect. Um, so we're, we're gonna go over a quick disclaimer um, that I always say, um, I'm gonna go over who am I, um, and we're gonna kind of go into um, some of the important things when it comes to security or getting into security. The first thing is, um, these are my own opinions. I'm not speaking on behalf of my employer or any other group i have uh, involved with. I'm not sponsored. I'm not endorsing anything or anyone. I'm simply sharing what's out there and available to use and some other advice based on my own personal experience. So who am I? I am a passionate security professional. Um, it all started way long before today, um, but I am a CISSP. Um, I have my CEH um, uh, certification and also my AWS Solutions Architect Associate certification. In the past, many years ago, I've had the SEC Plus, I think I got in 2011 or somewhere around there. Uh, been in IT for a long time before I ever shifted into um, uh, security. So currently I am a senior cybersecurity engineer. I'm also a cybersecurity manager. Um, I also am a master's student in cybersecurity management. Um, I have a bachelor's degree in cybersecurity with cloud computing. Um, yeah, and so I'm ultimately though a lifetime noob, and that's kind of where I get the name F noob. Um, and I'll kind of tell the story about that uh, a little bit later when we start talking about um, CTFs and stuff like that. So my journey, um, I like to share what my journey was because uh, sometimes it's very relatable to other people. So I started out in the help desk. Um, I took an opportunity to literally just field calls and tickets um, with the Department of Defense um, several years ago. And um, then from there, I moved on to more technical support, um, server administration, system administration. Um, and then I went into actually building out service desk and also doing system admin work or continuing on. Um, I moved into a security engineering role um, and then I also um, moved into security manager. So um, I do a lot of different things for uh, several different organizations, including the one that I work full time with, um, but I also uh, built the cybersecurity internship at Purdue University Global, um, at least the foundation that they're using today. Um, I also help with software development. I'm the software development manager over there. Um, I work with interns and uh, people that are looking to get into software development or cybersecurity. So that's kind of my journey and I plan to, <laughs> there's an arrow at the end because I didn't come this far just to come this far. So I have a lot more journey ahead of me. But how did I get here? I wanna point out how I got here because it may help you in your journey. Uh, you may be able to relate to it in some way but I do know that everyone's security journey is going to be different. So what was my first, how did I get my first security job? So I attribute that to four different things and I'm gonna go over that. The first thing is that I'm very passionate. Um, I was eager to learn. I self-studied and passed a ton of certifications. I had my own home lab that I was working in. Um, I you know, got my security plus. I had multiple Microsoft certifications. I, you know, worked on my CYSA when that first came out. So your cybersecurity analyst certification. Um, I was involved with um, all the things in community, in my community. I made it aware. I moved <laughs> across the state 
uh, to become more involved with the security community that I was passionate about being in. And I just really dove in and I wasn't afraid to kind of talk about that. The next thing was that I came with some knowledge. Um, before I got my first security job, I had a good experience um, in IT already. I had always been passionate about IT, um, but I maintained that knowledge and had some experience in it. And then also I had this thirst for new knowledge. So I was, I was curious and I continued to um, dive in and learn as much as I can. And the next thing is that I was very honest about, you know, hey, I'm a noob, um, but I will learn and I would love the opportunity to. And when I'm actually doing interviews and I'm interviewing people to come work for the company that I, you know, work for now, um, I love it when somebody says, hey, you know what, I don't know this specific thing, um, but I would love to learn it. I would love the opportunity to. Um, that's really the area that I'm studying. Um, you know, maybe I don't have a professional experience but I understand the concepts and I'm ready to dive in. But that's the kind of energy that, that I love hearing from candidates. The other thing was that um, I had the courage to know what I want, wanted and the courage to pursue it. So when I first got the job that I currently have um, or started working there, I should say, um, they were hiring me to do a very specific thing and that thing was not related to security. But during the interview process, I had asked them what, you know, if they had a security team and, and some of the, some security questions. And they had said to me, you know, um, we don't have a security team currently, but, you know, when we decide to hire a security team, we would love to, you know, maybe consider you for that then. So I thought, great, this is an opportunity for me to establish, you know, something within a, within a company and possibly build into a security team. This puts me in the area that I want to be in. So I moved um, from Goldsboro um, out here to the Raleigh-Durham area so that I could take this job because I thought, hey, there's going to be an opportunity for me to work in the, on the security team when they create one. So. I started working there. I was really awesome at my job. I've always been really awesome at my job. And at some point I saw, hey, you know what? There's, um, they're starting to advertise that they're looking for security people. They're trying to grow their security team. So um, I went to the, the manager of, of the department that the security team would fall under and I said, hey, I heard that you are hiring some security people. And they said, yeah, um, is that something that you would be interested in? I said, I would love to be interested in that. Like, I, I love security. You know, I just gave them the lowdown. Like, I've been to every single security conference in my region from, you know, Georgia all the way up to Washington, D.C. and beyond. And, like, this is really where my passion is. I'm learning as much as I can. I have my own home lab. I'm, you know, doing all kinds of things. I have security certifications. I'm in school for security. Like, you know, and I'm just giving them the list. And I just said, I would really love to be a part of this. And he said, well, I don't want to step on your current manager's toes. So, you know, we need to work with them and, and kind of talk about it and et cetera. And I was like, awesome. My boss happened to be out that day. Um, so he went and talked to my boss's boss, um, who happened to be the CTO. And the CTO called me into his office and he said, hey, or excuse me, the CIO. And he said, hey, I heard um, that you're interested in, you know, joining the security team or being hired for the security team. And I said, yeah, I would, I would love that. That's what we talked about in my interviews. It's, you know, just really where my passion is. And that's, you know, what I want to do with my career and my life, really. And he said to me, you know, I, I think you're really awesome, but I, I really saw you staying in your position that you currently have for another two to three years. And that was the end of that meeting. And I remember we had it on a Friday and I went home and I was just bummed all weekend. I was just like, I have security certifications. I'm doing all this stuff. Like, why wouldn't they even consider me for that role? Like, what, why? Why are they holding me back? Like, what am I doing wrong? Um, what is it that they don't see in me that I see in myself? 
And um, I went back to the office on Monday, and my boss happened to be in there, and he said, hey, I heard that you had a conversation about joining to the, joining the security team, et cetera, et cetera. And I said, yeah, and I'm, I'm really upset about the conversation that I had with the CIO on, on Friday. And he said, all right, well, let me schedule another meeting with him, and we'll see, you know, let's just talk about it. And I said, great. So um, I felt like I was getting called to the dean's office when they said, hey, Ashley, you want to step in the office? Like, because people were already in there, and they were ready to hear me out on this. Um, and I walked in there, and my boss and my boss's boss were in there. They were sitting around a table. And um, I sat down, and, um, you know, we started talking. And what I told them was, you know, what they had in mind for my career wasn't necessarily what I had in mind for my career, and that I felt like I had security certifications that were sitting on a shelf that they weren't utilizing. And they don't know this, but I was ready to just say, you know what, maybe this company isn't the company that I want to work for if they weren't going to give me that opportunity. And what ended up coming out of that meeting was um, the CIO saying, basically, all right, we'll give you, we'll start, we'll see how you do, we'll start giving you some security stuff, and then like in six months, if it's something that you've really picked up, then, you know, we will consider you and, and you know, transition you into a security role at that point. And I said, all right, great, that sounds good to me. And within three months, they moved me, and I became their security engineer. So um, had I not gone back into that office and really vocalized and, and had the courage to tell them that I felt, you know, differently than, than how they felt, um, chances are I would either not be working for that company or I would still be working for that company and I might not have made it into security or into it as quickly as I did. So having that courage to really know what I wanted and the courage to pursue it and, and put things on the line to say, hey, no, this is what I want to do um, is important. Um, I know not everybody has the, the ability or, or, or may not have that, uh, you know, the ability to do that based on their own circumstances. And I don't even know that I had that ability. <laughs> I don't know what would happen if I didn't have a backup plan. I was just like, all right. <laughs> Well, I'll figure it out, right? But I know this is what I this is what I want to do, and so somebody needs to know like this is where my passion is. So, anyways, um, I I like to point that out because it's important. It is your life. It was my life, and I wanted to make that decision, and I knew what I wanted. So, here are some of the suggestions that I say for, uh, that I talk about for helping you get into security or even advance your security. So the first thing is like, what are you interested in, right? When I first started getting into security many years ago, one of the things was everything was really awesome to me. Everything was shiny, everything was bright. I wanted to go down every single trail, um, but there's an issue with that. And that is that you never accomplish what you set out to do because you get distracted by all these other cool things. And so you kind of never finish one thing. So I always say, first off, what are your interests? What are you interested in? If that's too many things, then maybe decide what aren't you interested in. Ultimately, life is short. Follow your heart and intuition. Um, there's a lot to be said about the fact that you're going to spend more time at work, at your job, um, whatever that might be, than you do with your own family. So follow your heart because you just never know, you know, when your day may come. And at the, at the end of your life, maybe it's, you know, 60 years from now or, or 40 years or, or maybe it's, you know, a couple months from now, which I hope not. But what have you done with it, right? Have you been, uh, are you stressed out? Are you in a job you hate? Or are you going towards something that, that you really love and you really enjoy? Ultimately, you can narrow things down to, if you enjoy planning and designing, architect and engineering roles are awesome. There's a lot of things with engineering roles where they kind of cross into architect and vice versa. And depending on the size of the company that you are 
possibly working for or interested in working for, you know, some of those roles, you know, kind of kind of merge into each other. If you enjoy like going down rabbit holes after rabbit holes or investigating and analyzing incident response and analyst roles are great for that. There you can you can do a lot of that within those type of roles. Um, either way, whatever it is that you decide that that you're interested in, just interested in, stay focused on that. After you decide, hey, you know what? Maybe it is that I want to be a security engineer, or I want to do DFIR, or I want to go into GRC, or whatever it is. Research those job requirements, especially if you're not in the field yet. Um, how much experience do you need? How much education do you need? What certifications do you need? Um, these are all important for you to like really help you create your own goals. So this little chart I made <laughs> several years ago now, um, but these were a lot of the different roles um, within uh, you know, security, the amount of experience based on a certain number of, of you know, uh, searches that I did within like Monster, um, uh, LinkedIn, Indeed, et cetera. And really the experience edu and education kind of really varied all over the place with the exception of like the information security officer, chief information security officer. Obviously they want somebody that's been in the field for a while, whereas a lot of these other ones, it really just depends on the employer and who you know. Just one second, I need to grab a drink of water. When it comes to certifications, there's some really great certifications that can kind of span across multiple um, different genres, I would say, of security. And Paul Jeremy has a wonderful um, uh, display on that. Just give me one second, and I'm going to pull that up in another tab and kind of show you that. If you have not seen this, um, graphic. It's fantastic. So it's called the Security Certification Roadmap, and you can go to Paul Jeremy uh, with an I um, dot com, and he's got a couple different things here. But what this graphic shows you up at the top, you have the different genres of security. And then on the left hand side, you can see beginner, intermediate, uh, intermediate to expert. And here within those groups, you can see all the different certifications that are out there and also what uh, genres they kind of span across. So for instance, the CISSP, it's made up of eight different domains. It goes across multiple different, um, you know, genres. So when you're looking within these fields for a job, oftentimes you'll see that, hey, a CISSP is um, a great certification to have. Now, some of you that have done some research know that, hey, the CISSP, in order to get it, you really have to have that five years of experience before you can get a full-blown one. Now they're offering a CISSP associate. Uh, which allows you to pass the certification and then you get uh, um, uh, your mark as an associate member, which means you don't have the experience, but you have the knowledge. So that's important uh, to put out there. Also, one other thing to add, the pricing on these aren't exactly accurate. The full-blown CISSP certification is now $950, not the $699 that it states here. But the information about what genres the certification span is accurate for the pricing I would go to the actual um, uh, vendor itself. All right. Um, oops, sorry. All right, I had to find my controller. <laughs> okay, so. Again, on these, it's important to just do your own research, look up those, um, those the job requirements for each different role, see what it's gonna take to do, and then go from there. 
All right, on educations and certifications, I want to just say this education is important if it's relevant. If you're if you're in school right now, hey, great, I'm in school as well. It's it's great when the information is 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 as um, up to date as as it as we are now, as the environment that you're going to be working in. And oftentimes, I find that that's not necessarily the case when it comes to education. Sometimes you're learning things. Um, that may not be relevant to the role that you're going to be working in. So just keep that in mind. If you have the opportunity to be an advocate for, for what you want to do, including within your education, oftentimes you can change out classes to things that may be more relevant to the role or the field that within security that you're going to be working in. Uh, and I'll just put this out there, for example, when I first started um, my security uh, education uh, in an, at an actual college, um, I had the opportunity to, um, to take a software class. The software class that they automatically gave me through the system was, was C Sharp. Um, I'm not interested in taking C Sharp when there was another class for Python. So I opted to change the language that I was learning um, to a more relevant uh, language for the role that I was going to be in. So, that's one example, but there are several others within that realm. So just keep that in mind. Oops. Uh, I accidentally hit the wrong button. Moving on. Certifications are also um, great, um, but they can be even more relevant. But there are two different types of certifications that I kind of pinpoint. One is going to be vendor agnostic. So this is where you talk about your security plus or your CYSA or your Network Plus or your CISSP. Those are, those are great conceptual certifications where you learn a lot of the, the mindset and, and some of the more important foundations for the field. But then there are vendor certifications that are specific to that. So that's where you'll have your Microsoft or your AWS or, or um, you know, your Google or whatever it might be, um, Cisco, for example. Um, they're going to be specific oftentimes to that. Now, don't get me wrong. There are some like Cisco certifications, for example, that um, that do go over, you know, some security concepts as a whole and whatnot. But just keep that in mind. Um, some certifications um, are going to be very um, specific to the vendor and depending on what role and what company and where you are in your career, sometimes you know, like if you take a, a Cisco certification, that's great. But if you're applying to work for a company that has no Cisco equipment, um, and maybe they're on AWS or something like that, then maybe a general cloud certification or, or a specific vendor for the company that you're interested in um, will be more relevant uh, for, you know, for you uh, when you're working there. Ultimately, none of that matters if you didn't learn anything. I always hammer this in, especially to my interns. All of this is really important. It's going to help you pass HR filters, but ultimately, if you didn't learn anything, then you're going to struggle in your job. One of the things that I do when I'm studying, whether that's in my education or my certifications, if I don't understand something, I stop what I'm doing, I close the book, I pause the video, whatever it might be, and I go and I research that specific concept or tool or whatever it might be that I didn't understand. And the reason why I do that is because I want to be a subject matter expert in everything that I'm studying. I want those certifications and that education because I'm genuinely learning and want to be the best at what I do. And I want to have those concepts and, and understand the things that I've been taught. I don't want to just get my grade and go on. I don't want to just get my certification and move on. I want to understand and, and really learn everything that that certification had to offer. Ultimately, you're going to get out of it what you put into it. This is an investment into yourself. So whether that's your education or your certifications, it's your investment to you. If you don't put in 100%, the only person that is not going to benefit out of that is you. Put in your time, invest in yourself. Schedule your certification exam. If there's something that you're thinking about right now, whether that's your Security Plus, your CISSP, an AWS certification, whatever it might be, go and schedule it. There is no better demand 
and and something something that's going to force you to make sure that you're studying than when you have a deadline that's coming up for you to take an exam. It could be 30 days from now, 90 days, 180 days. You set your own time frame, but schedule the exam. Know that in six months, you are going to take that exam. And you know what? If you get to six months and you feel like you're not ready, reschedule it. Don't cancel it. Don't get a refund. Reschedule it. Put that on there and just work towards it. Put in the time, day after day, even if it's 30 minutes at lunch, you know, an hour after work, day after day, it doesn't matter how much time, it's just that you're consistent with it. So maybe it's only five minutes. Maybe you're listening to an audiobook on the way to work or, you know, whatever it might be. Just schedule your certification and then certification exam and then just work towards that. So. You figure out what you want to do, maybe, maybe not, maybe you're just thinking about it. You know, you got to go ahead and research those job requirements for the job that you want, right? All that stuff. Now what? You picked out a certification, you've got some things. Now you need to actually train for it. So this slide is just going to be filled with all kinds of resources. Some are going to be uh, bigger than others, some are going to be more important than others, but really just take a screenshot by the time I'm done with this so you have this information. Um, I have a cyber wiki at the internship that I use, and we have a training section that has probably a hundred different resources in there, and I keep saying that I need to export that because many people are asking for that. So I will also try to make sure that I send that information over to Mark um, by the by the weekend. Um, so that he can pass that on to you guys as well. So the first one that I want to talk about is SANS. Um, SANS is really great. Um, if you have the opportunity to take a SANS course or to do a SANS certification, take it. But the caveat is, is that there is a financial barrier for entry to take SANS. Um, they're expensive and they continue to get more expensive. Um, so, if there's an opportunity for somebody else to pay that for you, whether that's your employer or the government or, you know, a GI Bill or whatever it might be, I would recommend doing some SANS courses. Offensive security. If you are specifically interested in becoming a pen tester, pen testing is really hot, so I like to put this in there. Offensive security, your OSCP is one of the hottest certifications that you can get for pen testing. What you're paying for when you're paying for the OSCP, um, it's also a very expensive thing um, at the beginning. Um, you're paying for the lab time and the training that they give you um, for that or with that lab. It's it's all self-guided, although they have more expensive ones where they where you're actually in a class and stuff like that. But the self-guided training, you're you're paying for the lab time, and I think it starts around nine hundred dollars. Uh, for 30 days, possibly, uh, they're changing it here and there, but then it's a few hundred dollars every month for, for the lab time. But the certification itself um, to retake, the last time I checked, was only $60. Um, so th that just goes to my point that, that you're spending money on the lab and you're spending money on the training. The certification that comes along with it, <laughs> that's like gold on your resume for pen testers, but like that's not where the expensive part was uh, when you were taking the training for offensive security. Hack the box and try hack me, try hack me, I think comes up later. These are great resources. Um, if you're really new, I prefer try hack me. Um, and that's because they walk you through all of the different tools. Um, they start trying to teach you concepts and things like that. Um, and I know Hack the Box has started with a, a, like a, a learning tier as well. They have three or three tiers, I think, now um, to kind of walk you through as well. But it is a little bit harder if you're not familiar with the tools yet. So, um, Dan, I know that you were talking about earlier. Try Hack Me is fantastic um, for for some of the stuff that you were talking about. Hack the Box and Try Hack Me both have free tiers now. 
Hack the Box is a little bit more expensive if you do want to pay the monthly thing. I think it's like $20 a month, at least last time I checked. Whereas Hack the, or Try Hack Me was only like, um, if you have a student uh, email address, I think it's only like seven bucks a month. Uh, without a student email, it's like 10 bucks a month. And the training is really great. They also have different challenges in there. So they have learning paths, but then they also have challenges in there where you can actually go in there. They have a log for J room. They have a, a log for shell, you know, all the latest things, um, the um, HTML and HTA stuff, um, they're all in there. YouTube is great. A lot of conferences, you know, stream their stuff or post them. You can go and look at old DEF CON stuff. You can go look at old B side stuff. Um, old, some of the ISSA stuff, depending on which conference it is. Um, hack this site, it looks a little sketchy, but I'm telling you, if you're interested in doing more uh, web hacking, hack this site is great. It'll go through, yeah, like website hacking, for example. Uh, Python Institute is great if you're interested in um, learning Python, uh, doing things with Python, um, they have um, a low cost, um, certification that you can also get with the training that they have. Um, Cybrary, um, when I made this training slide, Cybrary was still on the free platform, but now that they've gone to a uh, pay platform or some of the content is pay, they actually offer labs in some of the areas. So I also say that uh, Cybrary is still a really good resource um, for that. Security Tube. Uh, over the wire is another one if you're interested in uh, offensive security over the wire has a bunch of stuff in there. Um, Humble Bundle. I love Humble Bundle. Um, I, <laughs> I absolutely push Humble Bundle. Um, just check it out. They have security stuff. You, you can do bundles of different things. You pay what you want and all the money goes to different charities that you can decide. Um, but you get a bundle of of ebooks essentially. Um, no starch press, I have a ton of no starch press. If, if you're more into um, actually printed books, um, there's a whole bookshelf right behind me just full of no starch press books. NCL, if you are in school, uh, I think there are some other things they have a professional version as well, but it's the National Collegiate League um, and they do all kinds of uh, they have like a, it's like a um, team, so, uh, or season, it's like a sport almost, they, 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 they have gamified it. Um, but the idea is that you get in there, you you practice, you go through training, and then you actually start a season, and it's all about um, security. So some of it is, is um, penetration testing or hacking and, and other things, you're looking at logs and really analyzing different things. So those are, those are really good. Conference talks are always really awesome. They're gonna be put on by people that are in the industry that have something to say about what's going on within the industry or you know whatever. So check out conference talks. Try Hack Me, again, AWS, if you're interested in AWS security, architect, whatever it might be, AWS has um, some great training on there. If you are in school, um, there is a um, there is a school version too where they offer even more um, training for students for free. Um, uh, Google also has the uh, a similar thing. Linux Academy has tons of great stuff if you're really interested in more Linux stuff. Microsoft as well, they have a bunch of free training on there. CBT Nungus if you're more into IT stuff. InfoSec Institute, NIST. NIST has a uh, website um, where you can get free or reduced cost training. And if you are in the government or, um, you know, in the military, there are, they post some other things that um, are specific um, that you guys can access as well for free. Um, so check out those. Also community training events. Right now, I hope that you're learning something from me and this is just another example of uh, something that you can be involved with. I know like in ISSA Raleigh, we used to have um, where, you know, we would do something on like a weekend or whatever, where we would do AWS training and like, you know, some of the people would get together and they would start going through AWS, um, you know, all the things within AWS to try to teach you. Um, they've also done like CISSP study groups and things like that. So 
Community training events are awesome. Lab time is really important um, that you really get your hands-on experience with the things that you're going to be working with before you go and work with those things in the real world. The easiest way to do this is through lab time. Now, there are some ways that you can do this. One way is to build a lab. I'm an old schooler. This is what I did way back when I had a physical lab. I literally, every single Christmas, birthday, anytime there was an opportunity for somebody in my family to buy me something, I requested physical <laughs> servers, whether they were refurbished or whatever, physical, um, you know, network routers and switches, like whatever I could get my hands on, access points, you know, if somebody was giving away something, I wanted it. Um, and that's really how I built my first lab. Um, but you can do labs now uh, virt in the, you know, virtually with VMware or, or um, the other virtual box um, or in the cloud. You know, there's Azure and Google and, and AWS. And really, when you're talking about cloud these days, a lot of companies are going to the cloud. So maybe if you're un unfamiliar with the cloud, building your own cloud, uh, lab in the cloud may help you become more familiar with the cloud. <laughs> um, so that may be something for you to do. If you're not interested in building um, your own lab, but you're interested in actually spending time in somebody else's lab, um, there are some free opportunities with like Hack the Box, Try Hack Me. Um, Immersive Labs, if you haven't heard of them, they have a lot of really great training as well. Um, Under the Wire, um, et cetera, Cybrary, uh, although Cybrary is cost now. Um, and then if you have a lot of money or, or can spend somebody else's dollars, um, you know, offensive security in SANS is also really great um, for the, the lab environments that they have. Now, some of the things that I want to point out, and, and I always say this is an exaggeration with the million dollars thing, because it is obviously, but at some of the conferences, sometimes uh, they may um, be sponsored by different people at SANS or like offensive security. And depending you know, on what you're doing, whether it's uh, joining a CTF, and, and actually I should add that here, um, sometimes the reward for that may be something from offensive security, like some lab time, or it may be like SANS uh, you know, um, lab time as well. Also do CTFs. Um, if you're interested in offensive security, go to the conferences, do the CTFs. Maybe you don't want to go to a conference, but you still want to do a CTF. There are all kinds of online CTFs, and actually I need to mention that on the previous slide um, moving forward. But just keep that in mind. If that's one of your goals, if that's what you want to do, do the CTFs wherever you can, and they're happening virtually globally all over the place all the time, so just do some research. The other thing is networking and collaboration. Um, first off, we have an awesome community here in uh, the Raleigh-Durham area. There's a ton of different slacks. Um, talk to people when you, when you go, when you join this ISSA, when you, if you go to the ISSA in Raleigh, um, if, you, if you do the DC 919 groups, the meetups, whatever, just talk to people. Maybe you're just at conferences, talk to them. I know like I, prefer to be an introvert, but there's so much to be like, it's so good to talk to other people that are in our industry and just kind of uh, building, uh, you know, I've built up a big network of people, um, just talking to people. And there's a ton of conferences within our area that I like to point out um, to all of, you know, I've, I've done this presentation like 30 times and I always point out these groups here DEF CON, great conference. InfoCCon, great conference. Cyber Warrior Con, that was back in Fayetteville, <laughs> way back when it seems like. Um, B Sides RDU, Kakalaki Con. So those are here, with the exception of DEF CON, you know, in this area. There's meetups too. So Women in Cybersecurity. There's DC 919 for, um, that's, a, that's a local DEF CON group. ISSA, like you're here at ISSA right now. Um, there's RTP Sec Beers, which is a big group of people within the Raleigh Triangle group um, that meet up. We have Oak City Locks for 2600. That's in this area, but I'm sure that you guys have other groups within your area too. And if you don't and you want to set one up, hey, 
that's your calling. If that's what you want to do, you want to get more people, do it. Social media. Social media is great. It's a tool, really. I know there's a lot of us that really hate social media, and, like, I'm one of those. Um, I honestly see it as a, as a place to document your security adventures. Ultimately, like, at the end of the day, social media is usually like, hey, look at me, hey, look at me, hey, look at me, or sometimes it's, hey, look at you, hey, look at you, right? But what are we looking at? Hey, look at me learning, look at me teaching, look at me volunteering. Ultimately, all the things that you document, you know, that, hey, I'm, I'm doing this thing today and I'm really excited about it, it's, you know, security related, you eventually be, have uh, other people start perceiving you as a security person or as somebody that knows about security. And with that comes the other additional networking and collaboration that could come from that when you are saying, hey, I'm in security or, hey, I'm learning, teaching, volunteering, uh, you know, here are my security adventures. Ultimately, you're showing your dedication to security and other people will notice that as well. So, I have some closing thoughts and other advice. It's just a few more things. Uh, just kidding. There's more than a few more things. But ultimately, some of the things that I'm looking at when I'm hiring people um, are, again, passion, knowledge, honesty, certifications and education, as well as diversity. And diversity is a lot of different things. I don't want to hire a bunch of Ashleys that had the same exact experience that I did that come from the same place that I did because I want additional perspectives within my team because diversity makes us stronger all around. Different people with different experiences make companies stronger. Some of the other things, if I'm on the other side, if I'm saying, hey, hire me, I'm also saying these things. Does your company have a focus on training? This is really important to me um, because training is important to stay relevant, especially if you're in the tech world, whether that's IT, security, software development, it does not matter. Technology moves at a rapid pace. And so the training has to go along with it. And if a company is not willing to invest in their invest in training uh, for their employees like what is that company doing like really do i even want to work there will i be reimbursed for my educational expenses i bring this up even though i don't utilize it within my own company for my own reasons i do bring this up because it does matter um, everything that I'm learning is going to be to benefit the company that I'm working for. So I almost feel like they should be willing to pay for my education in that field. So just keep in mind, um, not all of these may be relevant to you, but they are questions that can be asked. Like, can I work from home? Like, what's the remote work, or work from home policy? Um, can I bring my dog to work? I can bring my dog to work. I absolutely love that I can bring my dog to work. Um, that's that is probably an even more relevant question now than it was when I actually created this slide way before COVID. Um, I loved bringing my dog to work before COVID. Now, after COVID, it's probably even more important that, you know, my dog knows that I haven't abandoned it every day. Luckily, my husband works from home, but not everybody, you know, has that as well. Then also, what potential growth opportunities are available to me? This is a question I, I bring with a caveat. Um, because sometimes this can be hard for, for people. Um, I do ask this question personally because I want to know. Um, however, there are some people uh, on the management side that feel like if you're asking that question, why are you, you know, um, why are you wanting to be, why are you being interviewed for that role if you're already thinking about other roles, et cetera. But I always think that if a manager has that perspective, <laughs> Maybe I wouldn't want to work for them anyways, um, because a manager, in my opinion, should be there to help me grow with my career and also help me within that company. And there's no better, like, I want to be able to grow with that company, and I want to know that there's opportunities for me to grow with that company. So, caveat there. But ultimately, just go for what you want. And again, your 
what you want to ask your employer or potential employer are different, you know, maybe different than what I want to ask them. But either way, sorry, go for what you want. Put in your time. Make sure that you're spending time doing your studying, you know, whatever field or, or sector within security you're interested in. Um, pursue those goals. Like, so at the beginning when I said, or earlier when I said, hey, what are those job requirements? And you know, like, hey, I need to do two years with this. I need this certification. I need this much education. Like, put in that time and start making those your goals. Okay, my goal is to get the CISSP, or hey, my goal is to go get this GIAC certification, or whatever it might be. Just pursue them. Put in the time and studying, and then, you know, actually pursue those. And at the end of the day, you also need to know your worth. There have been times where, um, you know, I've, I've wanted to hire people. Um, or, you know, possibly been interviewing them that just truly didn't know what they were worth. And um, it's important that you do your research about what, you know, your experience and your certification uh, should be worth and, and the knowledge that you have. Um, and, and don't be afraid, um, you know, to, to just put that out there. Hey, this is what I want. This is what I'm worth and sticking with it and not settling for anything less. Employers are going to pay you what you are willing to be paid. And if you're willing to be paid less money, a company is going to pay you less money. Just FYI, even if you're the person that they want, if you say, I only want $50,000 and you're worth $100,000, the company is going to pay you $50,000 because that's what you were willing to settle for. STEM. This is, I love this part. Young minds are curious. Curiosity is a great asset of security. Passion can start young. Feed it to help build your community. Teaching kids will help you learn as well. Um, some of the things that I think about when, when I see this slide, um, my very, very first this is, this is really how I got passionate about IT. Um, I was in third grade and we had a trip uh, to the, we were going on a, a field trip to the library. And the library was having computer day, uh, a computer day event or whatever. And they had all these desktops um, opened up with the motherboards on the tables uh, in the library. And I remember the first time that I saw a motherboard I saw the tracers on the motherboard and I thought they were roads and the transistors and resistors were little buildings and the fan was a big stadium. And I just thought this was the coolest micro machine city ever. And I just wanted to know how it worked. How do you get, how do you, how does, how do computers work? How do you get, how does information pass, you know, within this motherboard? And I just, wanted to know all about it. And I love asking, you know, how does it work? Why does it work? And honestly, today, most of the things that I'm asking in the job that I have and throughout my career are the same thing. How does this work? How can I configure it? Why is it working? You know, what happened, et cetera. So that all happened a very long time ago. And that's really the seed that I needed to, to kind of be where I am today and where I'm going with my career. A couple more things that I like to say, never stop learning. Again, technology moves at such a rapid pace. The moment that you stop learning, you really become irrelevant. I will forever be a noob simply because I refuse to stop learning. And I know earlier I said I was gonna talk about how I got my noob name, uh, my F noob name. And what happened was I was sitting at my first CTF. I was sitting next to uh, Pete Hewitt, who's um, a wonderful guy. He's part of Raleigh ISSA, really the guy that, that got me started going to Raleigh ISSA and InfoSecon and, and B-Sides and, you know, all the things within our community. Um, I sat down next to him. I had just installed Cali on, on my uh, machine the night before, and I wanted to do this this. CTF. It was actually at InfoSecon many years ago. And I sat down and um, he says to me, Ashley, you need to come up with a Twitter handle. And I said, 
yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, it can't be something like your name either. That's too boring. It's got to be something cool like, you know, all the cool kids are doing it. And I said, awesome. And so um, I, like, don't have time for that right now because I am so excited about the CTS that I'm like, all right, I'll come up with a handle, like, after I'm done with the CTS. Like, I'm really to be, I'm ready to be a hacker right now. And so I had no idea what I was doing either. So I go ahead, and the first thing that you have to do is you have to create a username and password so you can sign into the CCF environment. I was like, awesome. I'm just going to use this password the one time, and then, you know, that would be great. So I create my username. I create my password. My password is whatever. I can't even remember. So I go ahead and submit it. And then I was like, thanks for creating an account. Now you need to log in. And I was like, oh, my God. I don't know what password I just created. <laughs> I wasn't even thinking about it. Like, I, w I didn't use a real password, you know, or something, you know, whatever. I just, I thought, I'm going into CCF. I should not use any kind of real password that I'm going to remember because it's a CTF, right? They're, this is a hacker environment. I'm not putting, like, any password in there that I care about. And so, um, <clears throat> I had to click the forgot password button, and when I did, the the server had been left in verbose debugging mode and what ended up happening was i got a a screen spit out of everything that happened like right on the page that i was doing um including the username and the password to the admin account of the server that was running the ctf and it was all in clear text right there for me and so um, that was my first ctf and really i could have owned the whole ctf um, and so the point of that was like, that was so easy, even a freaking noob could do it. And so that's how I got the nickname F noob. But it just goes to show you that security mis misconfiguration, like you don't have to be, <laughs> you don't have to be a real hacker. You can just happen upon it like I did. The other things that I want to say, um, about people in security or, or getting into security is not to think, take things personally and not to make things personal. So a lot of times what you're going to be doing in security is reporting on the stupid things that other people do. You can't go to them and, and say, hey, you're, you're an idiot, even if you believe it. <laughs> um, so don't make it personal. Stick to the facts. What do the logs say? You don't even have to contextualize the logs sometimes. You just need to say what happened based on the logs. And, and the problem, though, is oftentimes when you report that other people are doing things, they're going to have a lot to say about you. And sometimes it's going to be personal. And so I'm here to tell you not to take it personal. People are going to attack you. They're going to undermine you. They're going to tell you that your logs are wrong or the evidence is wrong or whatever it might be. And that, that might not always be the case. Don't take it personal. They're going to defend their stake of whatever it is um, to, you know, to the end, more than likely. Um, just don't take it personal. Just do your job, report the facts, don't bring emotion, don't bring personal stuff into it. Sit at the table. Um, I talk about this, I, I used to work for a company um, where um, we would have a meeting every single day um, in, in a boardroom, and all of the men would sit at the table, no women sat at that table, the women sat around the edge of the room. The first day that I went into this meeting, I didn't know that I was supposed to sit around the edge of the table. Uh, excuse me, the edge of the room, um, I sat at the table and I got a bunch of funny looks. But the reality was, was that I was just as important as anybody else at that table and my voice did matter. And what I was saying was important and I deserved a spot at that table and I took that spot. By the time I left that company, there were more and more women sitting at that table. And so I always bring that up. Sit at the table. You belong at the table. You were hired for your expertise or for your job. Sit at the table and be a part of the conversation. Speak up. Sometimes it's important to say things. Um, I, wanna, I wanna point out 
that sometimes saying nothing is a liability. If something is happening, speak up about it. Whatever that may be, whatever that may mean to you. Also recognize allies. Um, <laughs> this can mean a lot of things. Um, but I, I do want to tell you guys that sometimes being on the security team means that uh, not everybody in the company is going to like you, okay? Recognize those people that are willing to work with you, whether that's on the IT team, the, the software development team, whoever it is, recognize them, give them kudos. And, and even more than that, maybe it's somebody that's willing to, to uh, fight for you when you're not in the room. So recognize those people and just uh, thank them. Also know you're not alone. Um, this can mean a lot of things, but it also means um, within our security community, there are a lot of things or within the security just as a whole, there are a lot of things that probably happen to people um, within security um, that happen to other people as well. So whether that may be an attack that happened or, or maybe it's uh, relationships with other people like you know, an adversary, an adversarial like relationship between IT and security that's common and, and an adversarial relationship between, you know, GR, you know, your governance and compliance team and software developers or whatever it might be, right? So know that this, this happens, you're not alone. Like there are other people that are going through that as well. And, and even beyond just security just now, you're not alone. There's a whole community of people that are here to support you help each other. Um, if you have the opportunity to, to, you know, to reach back and help somebody and pull them up with you or whatever it might be, do so. Um, if you have the opportunity to share information with other people, um, do that. Get out here, do a presentation, spread the love and the knowledge um, where you can. It's really important. That's how we really like push. Then also we need more diversity. Um, I don't have to talk about the fact that women are leaving the industry at a more rapid rate than ever, um, but it's important that, you know, we're, we're hiring more diverse people that have different backgrounds and that there is places for everybody. So when you have the opportunity to bring friends to an ISSA, to, to hire people, let's do that. Let's make this security environment more diverse for everybody and, and a safe place for everybody to exist. First off, welcome noobs. I'm welcoming you into <laughs> my environment. But really, I, I left this on here. This is usually what I initiate my interns with. And they're all noobs. <laughs> Um, but I do have one last statement. This statement used to be on my work wall and I would read it every single day and it really means a lot to me. And, and I just wanna pass this on to you guys. And it's a statement by Steve Jobs um, in his commencement address at Stanford in 2005. And what he said was, your time is limited. So don't waste it living someone else's life. Don't be trapped by dogma, which is living with the results of other people's thinking. Don't let the noise of others' opinions drown out your own inner voice. And most important, have the courage to follow your heart and intuition. They somehow already know what you truly want to become and everything else is secondary. So with that, I want to thank you guys. Um, here's my contact information. Um, I do do Twitter. Um, I have messages open if you want to reach out to me there. Um, if you have questions here, please uh, feel free to um, ask them. Yeah, I had a question. Um, when people who are looking to get into cybersecurity come up to you and ask for advice, and the question is, if they should go a technical route or a non-technical route, what would be your opinion or advice to them? So my advice would be to them, what is it that you want to do? Do you want to be non-technical or do you want to be technical? What are you good at? What do you love? For a long time, I was 
I was technical and I'm still kind of transitioning from technical into more non-technical. Um, but I will say that I love both areas. I technical the technical stuff has always been a really great hobby of mine and I like to dive in. Um, but I also am very interested on the non-technical side. So we're talking GRC, uh, more like management stuff and, and et cetera. Um, so it really just depends on what that person wants to do. If, if, they're, if they're a technical person and that's what they love and that's what they're good at, then push them or let them push themselves towards that. Um, if, if they're not as technical or they struggle a little bit in technical, but maybe really good at like, you know, um, you know, doing more auditing type stuff or, or compliance and governance or whatever, then I would push them towards that. Both are very interesting fields to be in, to be honest. But I will say on the technical side, it's a, I think it's a little bit harder to really continue to stay relevant on the technical side than it is the non-technical, although, uh, you know, there's constantly new laws and, and other things that are always happening that you have to stay up to date with as well. Will, do you have, uh, do you have any commentary on that? Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, from the GRC perspective, technical versus non-technical on the GRC side of the house, you know, audit falls within GRC, right? And IT auditing does as well. So, you know, I've, I've got a, a staff member and and all they do all day night and, and night is is audit cloud stuff. Right. So uh, and they're very technical and, and, and hold quite a few certifications. So um, even in the GRC realm, uh, governance risk and compliance in that space, as, as well as on the assessment side, if you're an going to an assess, if you're going to assess someone, uh, there's a, a quite a fair bit of, of technical acumen that you have to, especially on the cloud side, because things very rapidly change, even in things like Azure, where Microsoft has notoriously been sort of stagnant in some areas, in the cloud areas. I mean, you can go to your dashboard that you go to every day, and then something brand new pop up in there. Like, hey, now you got this, and this is under, you know, the the purview, aka uh, Microsoft compliance module versus security module, because Microsoft wanted to change it that day, and that's the way they're going to go forward. So. Uh, yeah, so things change over on the GRC side, and you can be as technical on the GRC side as you'd like. Uh, yep. With, with the same level of acumen, technical acumen. Yeah. Great question. And again, there's like that, that, you know, maybe you aren't as technical, maybe you don't want to do all that stuff. There's a lot of really other great stuff within the non technical side that's also um, great and interesting to be a part of that um, I absolutely love. That's very well said, Ashley. I just wanted to thank you because, um, you know, Mark invited me to come sit in on the meeting tonight and I did not expect to be so thoroughly entranced by a story so closely paralleling my own. Um, I'm pretty new to the industry, so to hear somebody that's gone through it and come out the other side with all the struggles of trying to find your place and trying to make sure you're making the right moves because a misstep feels like it could, you know, take you all the way down the wrong path. It takes you forever to get back from. Um, that was just really good to hear, and I appreciated a lot of the stories you talked about where you struggled with those same types of decisions or with, you know, fitting in or making a place for yourself. To, um, it was a really great talk. Thank you. I appreciate that. One of the, um, one of the, some advice that I got from people when I was first starting out, um, this was my first, like the idea for my first talk ever stemmed from from really this. I had, uh, it was a different version of this. <laughs> this is much better. Um, but one of the things, one of the, the biggest advice that I got um, related to my talk was to make it personal. Um, I know I talk about not taking things personal in security, but I wanted to really try to get the point across like um there are a lot of struggles within security and and i think everybody has them and that even though i'm a woman in security there may be additional ones ultimately a lot of the struggles are going to be the uh, you know we still have similar struggles whether you're you know 
not a female or, or you are a female or whatever it might be. Maybe it might be, you know, so maybe, you know, you fit within some other spectrum of that. Um, I do this talk a lot. I've probably done it like 30 times. Um, I, I spend a lot of time talking to new people that are coming into the industry. And one of the things that I want to point out is that it's not all rainbows and butterflies over here. <laughs> like, not everything is pen testing. Um, there are there are there are challenges, um, but we're here for you guys. No, it's definitely not all rainbows and butterflies, and it's refreshing to hear somebody give that take and just talk about different experiences, and especially with picking the kind of path you want to go on. I know, like you talked about how difficult it was to break into security. I had a similar thing where. I started as a network engineer and it was kind of people that were mentoring me, having a lot of faith in me and wanting me to keep going on that route. And it just, I liked security more. And so hearing somebody go so far and be successful with it and, you know, kind of just not giving into that and picking what it was they liked. That's really cool to hear. Thank you. I'm upset. Um, yeah, and ultimately, I hope that, you know, my talk hit uh, for a couple other people in here. And like I said, I'm open for more conversation as well to anybody that wants to um, hit me up privately um, to, to ask for any advice or get any more of those training resources. Um, since I did set up, you know, the, the training path for um, the cybersecurity um, internship, um, I have a ton of resources. And if you are in school, especially, um, I have even more uh, resources for you just because there's a lot of um, different organizations that, that help people that have, you know, in a .edu address, <laughs> for example. So um, feel free to hit me up. Um, I'm, I'm here for you guys. And then also a lot of those same organizations I just want to point out um, that offer training or free training or reduced costs for .edus also will do it for, uh, for military um, as well. So thank you, Ashley. We appreciate it, uh, your time and your experience that you brought to our meeting. Uh, I'm a little upset because I was promised rainbows and butterflies. So <laughs> I'm going to keep looking for those. <laughs> Did Will, Will, Will you like to I don't to know me? what you just said. <laughs> You're, you were muted, but I think you threw a tomato at Carlos. Throw the tomatoes, no <laughs> rainbows and unicorns. Darn. That's okay. I like pizza sauce, so come on with the tomatoes. <laughs> but no, it's uh, you know, I could reflect on on your your conversation about the resources and just the community that's here in North Carolina alone. We have four ISSA chapters. You know, and including all the other cybersecurity groups that are out there as well. Uh, you know, you have so many people in like these different organizations as well. You're going to run into these people and you're going to start to get to know them and do that networking and it's going to work for you. It's going to open some doors. Uh, but just because those doors do open doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get the job. So. There is a struggle, and if there's anything we could say or add to Ashley's uh, conversation is just keep trying and keep reaching out to people because there's organizations like ours here who will take the time on the weekends, uh, evenings uh, to help you study, work on your resume, uh, get ready for an interview. So the resources, you know, just as many as those experiences or negative uh, aspects of the industry, these are the positives that balance that out and sometimes overshadow those negatives. So I hope that you guys continue and uh, keep on trying to go for cybersecurity and be part of the change in the environment. Very well said. Oh, speaking of Carlos, that reminded me, I um, I need to do a respectful shout out because what you were just speaking about actually um, one of your board members did for me very recently. So. Speaking about reaching out to your contacts and connections, I just happened to be having a conversation with Mark one day and mentioned that I was drowning in DOD's new DevSecOps processes. And um, 
in less than 24 hours, I was on a Zoom call with him and one of his contacts that's currently doing that whole entire thing at Bragg. So very cool to um, have somebody just hook you up with somebody else with that experience. Yep, Mark is uh, Mark is my study buddy. So <laughs> uh, anytime I don't understand anything or uh, just need to talk about some, you know, cybersecurity stuff or personal stuff, it's uh, off to Scrub Oaks it is. Mark knows all the things. <laughs> he does. Instead of ask Jeeves, we should like make an ask Mark. Uh, I second that. Anybody else want to join in? <laughs> I know nothing. <laughs> I don't know anything. I'm just Did really I fast at Google. All I, the eyes have it. All the eyes have it. Mark is now the Wikipedia. I, I didn't even like realize I was kind of showing my age a bit with that. I'm not even very old. Like, ask Jeeves, how long ago did they kill him? <laughs> I think we're aging ourselves if we answer anything yeah. as if we know what ask Jeeves is. Please, the fifth. It's all right. I'll let it slide. It's like asking somebody uh, what AOL is. I know a couple of people still using that, and they are old. <laughs> I ran into a customer that still had an AOL account and my job dropped. So it's not even just AOL. If somebody says, Hey, do you remember Netscape? <laughs> They're old. Those are still active. It's blowing my mind right now. Hey, some of us All can't right, guys. our age. <laughs> Well, thanks for having me. I appreciate um, the conversation and everything. Feel free to reach out to me. If you didn't get down my contact information, Mark and Will and uh, Carlos uh, know how to get in touch with me. I'm also on LinkedIn and whatnot. And, um, you know, I don't mind accepting invites. I, I will say this though on LinkedIn, and I'm sorry about this, Mark and everybody else who tried. I don't really read the messages on LinkedIn because I'm. I get so much job spam from everybody. <laughs> like, I just, it's just spam on LinkedIn right now. <laughs> so, sorry. So, yep. everything but LinkedIn. All right, everybody. Thanks, Thank Ashley, for, for joining us. Uh, this concludes our meeting. And uh, hope you guys have a great night. And if you guys need anything, please reach out to us and we'll be more than happy to work with you and figure out what we could do. Bye bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye. Have a good night.